All right, uh, welcome back everybody. So we continue with the second part of Tamash's talk and I will be now again using myself and uh, giving the floor to Tamash. Okay, so thank you. So I will now continue and um, I will actually very quickly skim some few parts of the paper itself so that I can formulate uh, this um, conjecture and or one of our main results at the end. Um, okay, so the paper we study this modular space of Higgs bundles, a so-called bielanitsky birula partition or decomposition of the modular space of Higgs bundles. And uh, we developed the theory, in fact, in a more general class of, um, of varieties. And, um, and in fact, we prove everything from sketch. So we don't, you don't need to know bielanitsky birula paper. Uh, in, in basically, everything is uh, reproved in the paper. Okay, so let's see um, um, the, this uh, theory. So uh, first we start with the class, defining the class of varieties where this theory implies nicely. So we will take a complex semi-projective variety for many purposes, we can assume it's smooth, but in practice, actually, sometimes it's not smooth. And this actually is interesting to look at non-smooth examples, but you can, and we should think about the smooth case anyway. So then we have um, the definition, what's semi-projective? Semi-projective means an extra structure on the variety, namely a C star action. We have a C star action on our variety, additionally to just the usual stuff. And uh, this, um, this has three properties, the cease direction. First, the, the cease direction is linear, by which we mean that uh, it embeds cease star equivariantly to uh, CPN with the linear action of C star. That's what linear means. It actually, if it's smooth, for example, or even just normal, then it's enough to say that this is quasi-projective, then it's going to automatically have a linear embedding. But Actually, sometimes it's even non-normal, non so you have to be um, you have to be um, uh, being in the general case anyway. But just say smooth, and then it's uh, automatic if it's quasi-projective. Second is that the fixed point set has to be proper and therefore projective. And the final assumption is this um, um, attractive property that every um, every uh, limit to when lambda goes to zero uh, exists for every point in X, I apply the C star action, you have a C star orbit, and when you close down the C star orbit at lambda equals zero, the limit point should exist. So if the variety was projective, then of course this is automatic and, uh, and uh, you also have the other direction, but for semi-projective ones generally, which uh, the examples are actually not projective. So you can take any projective smooth variety and take its cotangent bundle. That's a perfectly good example to think about. Uh, or you can take the moduli space of Higgs bundles or main application, but for example, Nakajima queer varieties and many of these hyperkiller varieties, in fact, the ones appearing in which appeared in um, Sergei's talk, they are all examples uh, with the right cis direction uh, of semi-projective varieties. Um, so what can you do if you have such a C star action? You can actually use it to have a sort of, you can do Morse theory or you can do a cell decomposition of your variety in a canonical way. You can define cells as follows. So we take um, a fixed point of the C star action and um, we can collect all those points which flow down to that point. So here is alpha. I take all the points in X where the limit in the, at the lambda equals zero is this point alpha. So we think of this alpha is a fixed point and then we have the upward flow from alpha are those points which flow down to my point alpha. In the theory of din dynamical systems, the analogous uh, manifold is called a stable manifold. Um, and you can take as the opposite one. So you can take those things where the limit at lambda equals infinity is your point alpha. We will call this the downward flow from the fixed point alpha. And then it's also the unstable manifold of the fixed point. So these are classical things introduced by say Bielanski Birula in this algebraic geometric situation but already in Smale's work in, in the in dynamical system case. 
So what Bielanitsky Birula proves, and again we reprove in because it's slightly more general, um, and that's why I wanted to have a complete proof. Um, we proved that these um, these subsets, these upward flows, these stable, stable manifolds are actually locally closed submanifolds, and they are cells, they are a vector space. And we actually know what vector space it is up to with respect to the cease direction. It has a natural cease direction. And the theorem is that as a as a cell, as a vector space, it is just the infinitesimal information you can read off at the tangent from the tangent space of, of the manifold. So you take the tangent space, you take the positive weights in the cis direction there that will give you t plus or you can take the negative weights that will give you t minus and the corresponding vector space with the cis direction will give you the corresponding um, stable or unstable variety so you have a beautiful uh, Tamas, uh, yes uh, there is a question of nikita on the chart and the question is uh, uh, about uh, lambda going to infinity. So you, you say that there are those points for lambda going to zero, but is there a symmetry with lambda going to infinity or, or not? So in the case of Bielanitsky Birula, who studies the projective case, then yes, the other limit will also exist. For us, no. So if you take the cotangent bundle, for example, you will have no point besides the fixed points which will go have a limit at the infinity they will escape to infinity so the answer is no only the downward flows will always have a limit and some many of the points will have no limit uh, uh, that direction so you will see that it will give two different things so now we have these cells and the semi-projectivity says that if i collect all the upward flows then that gives that covers the whole space um, and you have this, what we call, we can call the Bielanitsky Birula partition. And these are cells. It turns out for our case or all these cases, it's actually going to be Lagrangian cells. And this gives you a, a beautiful cell decomposition of the variety. But because exactly because that the um, negative ones, the downward flows don't cover the whole space necessarily, but in all cases, they still give an interesting locus. It's called the projective core. It's a projective sub-variety inside the variety. So in the case of the cotangent bundle, it's just the zero section. Then we call this the core of M, and then it is a, of X, sorry. Um, anyway, so it's, um, how can I change it? Yeah, so this is X. Uh, and the theorem is that, in fact, for example, if it's in the smooth case, it's a, it's a deformation retract. So the topology is captured, but it's usually a highly uh, non-trivial, um, irreducible variety. Um, so that's the core. Um, and in the case, by the way, that we have the modular space of Higgs bundles and all these cases, you have a symplectic structure on your variety additionally, and the cis direction has homogeneity one with respect to the cis direction. Then you can deduce that um, all the upward flows, these um, cells are Lagrangian and also the core is Lagrangian. So that will be the case for the moduli space of Higgs bundles. But the nice thing is that already in this general history of the Bielinski Birol decomposition, you can make a definition of being very stable. So you say that the fixed point of the cease direction, so this is a fixed point of the cease direction, or its um, upward flow, we will say it's very stable if it does not intersect any unstable variety besides the trivial one, besides its own unstable variety, of course, it will intersect that. But the intersection with the union of all the unstable varieties, which is the projective core, should be trivial. It's just alpha. If you say then this is a very stable manifold, not just stable manifold. And um, right, and then the first thing we prove, uh, which is already non-trivial, is that something is very stable, is precisely um, uh, about the closeness of the upward flow. So if the upward flow is closed precisely, then this is very stable. And that gives you a view of what is very stable is it's somehow the maximal elements in the natural partial order you can put on the fixed points uh, of the C direction. So you have this um, C, the fixed points of the C direction, and you can define a partial ordering by saying that one is about the other. If one is, uh, oh, I should have said, closure here. If one is in the 
closure of the other's uh, upward flow, or similarly, one is in the closure of the other's um, uh, downward flow. And that gives you a partial ordering. And somehow this partial ordering is already some kind of combinatorial shadow of how these cells glue together. And we will say that this notion seems to be very relevant to these um, Hecke transformations and all the big picture for the moduli space of Higgs bundles. Okay, so now let me start to talk about the moduli space of Higgs bundles. And as in the paper, uh, we will concentrate on the case when G is GLN, that's the simplest, most classical Higgs bundles. We have the smooth projective complex curve C. And the, in this case, a Higgs bundle is very simple. It's a rank N vector bundle on the curve together with this uh, Higgs field. We call this a Higgs field, an auxiliary section of the adjoint bundle, which in this case is the endomorphism bundle of E. So it's like a matrix locally, but with values in the canonical bundle of the curve, which is just one forms. So that's a, a Higgs bundle, there's such a pair. You have a notion of semi-stability, the natural one for, if you know, stability for vector bundles, but you actually only take sub-bundles which are invariant by the Higgs field. And then you can, there is a construction, you can construct the moduli space of semi-stable Rankin, and uh, usually we, in this GNN case, we fix S so the degree D of Higgs bundles. If you don't like to have an abstract degree, let's just take this concrete one because most of the things I will say will happen here for this degree. So then on the moduli space of Higgs bundle, there is a canonical C direction. I mean, a, a one which is just part of the, the game. You can rescale the Higgs field by a scalar. And then, um, Okay, what is also crucial in this story, I already mentioned the, he the Hitchin system. In this case, it's very simple. You just take the characteristic polynomial of the Higgs field, uh, and that will give you a map. The coefficients of the characteristic polynomial will be sections of powers of the canonical bundle, um, and that is going to be a vector space A. And uh, there are two properties now of the Hitchin map, which are useful. One is that it is a proper map, and the second, that it is uh, T equivariant. If you allow the T action on H0 of K to be of weight one on K squared, weight two, et cetera, weight N. So we use different weights on, on these spaces, then it's going to be the Hitchin map is going to be uh, T equivariant. And from these two facts and the fact that the vector space with positive uh, weights of an action of a C star is S of semi-projective, you can deduce from this is that M is uh, semi-projective. So we can apply this uh, bielanitsky birula decomposition of the previous section. And instead of going into the history and all this, why it's called very stable, it has to do with things people called very stable bundles. Uh, but let me not do that because that would be really not in the direction of the talk. So let me just say that a Higgs bundle, which is fixed by the um, C star action, is um, called very stable. If it is very stable in the sense uh, I had above, uh, in, with respect to the C star action, if and only if its upward flow is uh, very stable, that is to say, it is. Uh, disjoint from the core. And the core here, you as an S so a separate meaning, it's actually the nilpotent cone, the reduced or the reduced of the nilpotent cone is a subscheme, but that doesn't matter now. So it's just the nilpotent cone, and that has to be uh, just E itself. Um, and equivalently if it's if it's closed. So if you take those upward flows which are closed, which are somehow on the top of this partial ordering by closing down upward flows, then those are the so-called very stable Higgs bundles. There are, we don't really understand them completely. We understand them in the case when the Higgs field is zero, which I don't want to talk about, which has a prehistory. But let's look at, instead of somehow these, uh, the case when phi is zero is in my mind is in the bottom, of this um, partial ordering in some sense. And on the top, things are very different. They are, uh, the Higgs bundles there are called of type 111. So I just concentrate on this case. Anyway, that's what we look at the, in the paper anyway. So we take 
very stable Higgs bundles, Higgs bundles of type, as we call it, one, one, one. The point is that the fixed points can be classified by types of order partitions of n. It turns out they are related to parabolic subgroups in your, in your group. Uh, G and then to each type there could be fixed points of that type. And let me give you the type one 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 examples. And we will also construct them. So this in the other story we call them maximally split. It, it is the case when the vector bundle is the direct sum of line bundles. And these line bundles we denote M0 up to Mn minus one. We fix these line bundles on the curve C. And we will have these um, connecting uh, little Higgs fields, which I call BI, uh, from the I minus one line bundle to the next one tensor K. In other words, these are sections of the homomorphism bundle, which is just MI minus one inverse MIK. So these are sections of some line bundles. And we can think of them in terms of their divisors. And in fact, we will do that. So we will take the divisor, which is an effective divisor of uh, the zeros of this uh, small little connecting Higgs field, bi, it's going to be effective divisor. So all points appear with positive coefficient. And I just actually for preparing for this talk and trying to formulate it in the abstract um, general case, I realized that uh, it actually, you can add this extra divisor to, to make things much more uh, symmetric and general. So we will actually also take a divisor representing or first line bundle M0, but now this time this doesn't have to be um, effective. It could be any divisor, we will call it delta zero. It's not uh, unique, but things should be um, the same if uh, you take a different delta zero. Now what we will fix is this um, n-tuple of divisors. The, the last n minus one of them will be, um, will be effective. The first one could be any divisor. And it turns out that up to isomorphism, each type one, one, one Higgs bundle is determined by this data. Uh, and then let me show you how that looks like, that Higgs bundle which we will call E delta is uh, going to be the Higgs bundle from the vector bundle is going to be, as I said, maximally split. So you have a direct sum of these line bundles, that's the underlying bundle. And then it will have the Higgs field, will map it to the same vector bundle zero to um, as orbit the canonical bundle. And then the Higgs field is just these lower triangular Higgs field where you have B1, uh, B2 up to Bn minus one just below the main diagonal and zero everywhere. And it turns out it's exactly plays that the roots of um, uh, some roots of the, of the, um, of this root system, which in the general case, that's how you should think about this. But anyway, that's called the type one, one, one Higgs bundle. It's fixed by the C's direction. And, um, and then we also assume because we are, uh, we want to be in our moduli space that it is uh, very stable. There are uh, a few uh, fine variant sub bundles, namely you can add together these line bundles at the end, mn minus one or mn minus one plus mn minus two. Those will be fixed by phi. You have to check that um, their slope is uh, less than, uh, than the slope of the whole thing. And that gives you some non-trivial conditions on the degrees of these line bundles. Actually, we feel that uh, for the general story, you might not even need this, but because I want to work with the moduli space instead of the stack, I assume this is uh, stable stable first. So we assume it's stable. Then uh, we have uh, our theorem. So that's one of the class main classification theorems in our paper is that such a type one, one Higgs bundle is very stable if and only if the last n minus one of these divisors together are reduced. There is no multiple uh, zero here. So if you take these bi's together, they cannot have a multiple zero anywhere. So this is a reduced divisor. 
and that's you can only if it's very stable. So that's already uh, was nice. Let me sketch you. Actually, I, I you normally don't do proofs because I don't have time for the rest. But now I just sketch you the proof because it really will be ringing precisely the Hecke transformations and it will show why it is the same, the story, what uh, I started to, to consider in the beginning about Hecke transformation. So very, very sketchy proof by Hecke transformation. So what is a Hecke, in fact, a fundamental Hecke transformation? As I told you, these are classical ones. Many people look at things like this. And so Hecke transformations. So, okay, so what's the setup? So we have a Higgs bundle and we want to uh, do a Hecke transformation. You will do it at a point of the curve. We will modify the Higgs bundle at a point of the curve. We will take a k-dimensional subspace in the fiber of the vector bundle at C. So this will be the case fundamental Hecke transformation, possible Hecke transformation. Uh, and we want this uh, to be a phi invariant uh, sub bundle. V tensor chi C. And then in that case, you can cook up uh, first the quotient space of the fiber modulo this subspace V. And then using that, you can make the following Hackett modification of your Higgs bundle. So you have your Higgs bundle here. Here is your phi. You will map it to by restricting to the point C and uh, um, going to the quotient by, by V. And we will take this at uh, the point, uh, the structure, sheet, the, the skycreeper sheath at C. And then now this is a surjective um, morphism of sheaves. So you can take the kernel, which will be as torsion free on the curve. Therefore, it's going to be a um, locally free sheaf. So it's a vector bundle. But this, sub, this embedding is not a vector bundle embedding. It's, a, it's just a sub sheaf. And then the whole diagram can be. So first you have the, because of the assumption that the subspace was phi invariant, you will have an in-use. Um, map on the on these uh, Ws, and uh, you will be able to um, define this phi prime. There is a canonical way once you fix this data to get a Hecke transformed Higgs bundle. Okay, so what do I say about this? Um, so this is the fundamental, the case fundamental Hecke transformation transformation of E phi at the point C. Note that every, so what you have to look at is the Higgs field restricted to the point. It's going to be some matrix basically and endomorphism. If it's regular, for example, you will have finitely many uh, invariant ones. On regular, for example, it could be zero, then you get the whole Grassmannian. Um, but uh, if it's regular, we like that, then it's finite many. If it's regular semi-simple, then you get n factor, uh, and no, then you get, uh, wait, wait. Yeah, I don't remember now. Uh, and then you have a single one if it's, um, if it is, um, if it is regular nilpotent. So it's a regular nilpotent one, and that will be, important at some point, there is a unique um, k-dimensional subspace which it fixes. Then you can do a single possible uh, Hecke transformation. And now, uh, Tamas, uh, yes. Uh, just, uh, just a simple question. In the previous part of the talk, uh, those uh, Hecke transformations, they were labeled by weights. What, what, what are the labels of uh, those transformations you're describing? The, the case fundamental representations of GLN. So the exterior, the case exterior power of the standard representation. That's why I call this the case fundamental Hecke transformation. It might be n minus k, I haven't, which one it is, uh, I'm not sure, but. Okay, so this is the simplest ones. And you will see that the case fundamental representations of GLN are very special. 
and then they will not have really um, just tried the same analog in general case. But uh, so case fundamental, okay. Then the proof is by induction on, on the um, size of this divisor. So we take this divisor, which we know is, uh, we want to say that it is very stable and only if it is, uh, is uh, induction on this. Induction on the size of the divisor. We start with the first one, the first case when it's zero. When it's zero, so the step one, when it is a zero, then, then this is a zero. The size of this is zero. That means that is the zero uh, divisor. This means that all these guys are zero. They are all effective divisors. And that means that you have what is called a, a un, this uniformizing Higgs bundle. This is the, um, the center. And we will take the case also, we will say just for simplicity that the first divisor is also trivial. And then M0 is just the trivial bundle on the curve. And then we will get what is called, what we call the canonical, we call it E0. Uh, which is actually the right notation now because of this new, uh, right? Because we call this thing E delta. Delta was this vector of divisors. Now all the divisors are zero. So E zero, what is this? So this is a vector bundle is OC plus K inverse plus et cetera, uh, K minus plus one. And you get the K tensor version and the matrix is just one, 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 one. Uh, everywhere. So this is like this canonical uniformizing Higgs bundle. This is, I, I actually also call this sometimes the tip or the top of the iceberg, canonical Higgs bundle, it's on the top of the nilpotent cone. And it's upward flow, you can identify it with something which had been studied before. So you take the upward flow, which actually we will denote just omega zero plus of our flow from this um, canonical uniformizing, uniformizing Higgs bundle is, um, is, the Hitchin, is the Hitchin section. Is the Hitchin section, is the section of the Hitchin map. And there is a, you can take this canonical one. So you have this canonical section of the Hitchin map and actually therefore it's very stable. This means that in particular, it intersects the zero fiber in a single point at this uh, canonical uniformizing Higgs bundle. So it's very stable. Basically, actually, and Nigel pretty much already observed this for in his paper when he did it 20 years ago, because he observed that this upward flow, or this hitching section is closed by the fact that it is a section. And that's basically observing that this is very stable. And then the step two is that to start to apply Hecke transformations to this uh, hitching section. And then what we observe is that every of these type 1, 1 Higgs bundle uh, can be reached. Here in the paper, we only look at the simplest uh, fundamental Hecke transformations by fundamental. Of one after the other, not by a single one, you have to apply one after the other, you have to change the points where you do it, etc. by fundamental Hecke transformation. But we have a good understanding how that happens, this Hecke transformation, what does it do uh, with this uh, Higgs field and uh, everything. And now in general, by the way, the underlying bundle will no longer be uh, just a um, direct sum of line bundles in the on the, on the section. Uh, and uh, so, but anyway, we understand this. And then you can deduce uh, the theorem by some, constructing some Hecke curves in the non-reduced case. So let me not uh, say more about that. So now I finish. Oh, yeah. very good. I was extremely fast there. Uh, so maybe I can now slow down a little bit for this last section. Because now I can uh, formulate actually, which is in our paper or main uh, conjecture and result, and then uh, indicate how this can be generalized to other groups. How does it generalize to other groups? of type one, one, one flow. So the amazing thing is that after thinking about this picture and this conjecture, which only happened uh, at the end of the paper, yeah, we wrote this paper like for two years. 
So it's a, it's a big, big effort. And at the very end, suddenly, we started to understand how this relates to the original corpus timbitan thing and all this general case. And then you get uh, this much nicer labeling, for example, of these fixed points. So the first thing is just a combinatorial observation. So we had labeling or type 1, 1 Higgs bundles with this vector of, um, um, of, um, of divisors. The first one could be anything, any divisor, the, the, the last n minus one has to be effective. And there is a beautiful different labeling of the same data, because instead of thinking about divisors and, and of them, we think about the points uh, of the curve and see which ones they belong to, which divisor they belong to. And this way, you can actually look at this um, as a different data. You can look at this as a map. The same data can be looked at as a map from the curve to where? Well, to two weights, to dominant weights, which I call P plus. In this case of GLN, in general, it will be the Leglands dual group. So we will take. Um, you can see that these type one one uh, Higgs bundles or the generalization to other groups actually can be thought of as a map from the curve into dominant weights of the Leblanc dual group for uh, which has finite support. So almost all points go to zero, except that finitely many you actually have an irreducible representation of the Lagrange dual group finite support. And this data in the GNN case beautifully translates into that. And, um, and then in this way, you have a very nice way to see uh, when it's something very stable. So all the results, when we said that this uh, last n minus one has to add together to the non-reduced thing is some, somehow weird. But uh, here, uh, this formalism very stable if and only if the image of this mu in this other, other parametrization is lives inside the so-called minuscule weights, the minimal elements inside the dominant uh, weights with respect to the natural, the usual partial order. So this is called min the minimal, or actually the word that is minuscule, minuscule weights. These are the minimal weights with respect to the standard uh, partial order on dominant weights, minimal. Here you actually have infinitely many of them because you can translate always with the, the determinant uh, character and these powers. But the usual, semi, the simple case, you have finitely many uh, minimal ones, minimal with respect to uh, the usual order. Let me write this uh, mu one less than mu two. If mu two minus mu one is a non-negative linear combination of positive roots. Okay, so that's the usual order. And this formalism, if you scale, uh, label things like that, then something is very stable, which you remember very stable was somehow on the top of the iceberg, top of the, the partial, the lattice of partial, the partial ordering. And, and that it corresponds to here to the minimal one, somehow the two orderings are going to the opposite direction. So I, I find this very satisfactory. And in fact, we conjectured the analog statement for, uh, for any, any reductive group G uh, generalization. General, we, we have a lot of, we can probably prove this, but anyway, generalized conjecture to, um, to general G case. And then let me then say the final, uh, uh, the result or, or circle of ideas in our paper is to think about the mirror of these upward flows. So, so we formulate it as a conjecture. So we take, okay, let's take the case when we are in this um, case when, um, when it's, it's very stable. So that is in the minuscule case. In, in the GLN case, actually, it's the fundamental um, representations besides the, the zeros one or besides the first one, which you can actually, um, uh, that, that, yeah, we can, can translate all of them anyway. So you have these minuscule uh, uh, weights and then the mirror of the upward flow 
now I wrote, write everything uh, in this new parametrization. So it will be replaced by E mu. And then this one means the upward flow from uh, E mu. So the mirror of the up, the structure sheaf of this Lagrangian upward flow should be uh, very simple. You just take the universal Higgs bundle in, in the mirror. In the GLN case, it's just the universal Higgs bundle. Uh, okay, you have to take it in this representation. Um, in the GLN case, these are the fundamental representations. Uh, in, in this case, because we are in minus Q, so these are some fundamental representations. Um, so I think of mu as a vector uh, attached to points, uh, say J points of the curve, uh, CJ, and these things are, uh, in this case, um, minuscule weights. And I take these, uh, this in this representation and restrict to the corresponding point CI and I tensor them together. And uh, so that's our conjecture. And then in the paper, we prove the following, uh, which support this uh, conjecture. And that um, this is true generically, true generic fiber of the H on generic uh, H inverse uh, A. So you have to do Fourier Mukai transform and everything works out beautifully. Again, this actually just follows from the Kapustin Litten thing, by the way, which in the generic fiber was supposedly reproved by Donaghi and Pantev. So I believe it follows from Donaghi and Pantev as well, but we do it in our, in our uh, framework. So it's a, maybe a new proof of the same fact in the GLN case. Um, then, Actually, I like to call this lambda mu. It's some uh, vector bundle on the, um, the mirror moduli space. And uh, we proved that it is a hyperholomorphic vector bundle. And did you have a hyperholomorphic connection on it? And finally, the, the last thing which uh, mm, which uh, was the motivation. If you push forward the structure sheet of this upward for this very stable upward flows, then you get a uh, T uh, equivariant vector bundle. Equivariant uh, vector bundle. Vector bundle. And, um, and then this vector bundle on the, on, on the pitching base is, as I already mentioned, is determined by the fiber over zero as a C star module. And then I take the C star character of the fiber of this thing at uh, zero. And this is the same. You know, so this part, of course, we cannot prove anything because it's over the nilpotent cone, the worst fiber of the HNF. So we don't have information really what should be the mirror. But for those generic observations, we can check and this works that this is precisely this, um, uh, this vector bundle at the canonical Higgs bundle. So this is really nice. This is then a product of the T character is a product of binomial coefficients, which are the uh, C star characters of these um, um, of, of the fundamental representations of, of GLN. Um, and um, so that's nice. We call this, by the way, because it was in the title. This is also, also called equivariant multiplicity, this polynomial. So that's why it's in the title, because it really is our main uh, tool to, to measure these vector spaces. And, and then I finish uh, with formulating, roughly speaking, this conjecture, which is a real excitement for me right now, um, that this uh, picture have a natural generalization uh, for a general reductive group, for a general G. And uh, we take a um, such a map from C to the dominant weights of the Leglands dual. And to this, we can attach a certain um, maximally split Higgs bundle, a fixed point of the C star action. So to this, we can attach this Higgs bundle, which is now a G Higgs bundle, fixed by the C star action. 
and uh, we can um, oh that's not what we do right now actually so we can do this but uh, we actually just first look at the epsilon zero the canonical uniformizing higgs bundle we look at uh, the corresponding upward flow from this which is the hitching section and then we will apply the Hecke operator on this um, the structure sheaf of the hitching section and uh, we push this forward so this is um, going to be some sheaf in general it's not uh, going to just have a support of a cell. In fact, the support, the conjecture is going to be a union of upward flows, precisely the ones which are above uh, or cell in the partial order or below it in the usual partial order on, on dominant weights, which as it should be. Uh, and the, uh, yes, and the fiber of this at zero uh, should have, um, should be isomorphic with the mirror and the mirror is actually just this tensor product um, of these um, the universal G Higgs bundle in the representation given at that point and that's what we call lambda mu and the canonical Higgs bundle and the thing is that this is T equivariantly true and so we get a numerical thing is that the the C star equivariant character of this vector space which we you completely work out from the geometry on the G side. Um, and as I say, we have a, some feeling of, we know what the support of this shift should be. Um, it's going to be unfortunately um, non-reducible, -re highly, highly reducible. You will have more than one cell in the non-very stable case. Uh, but it's nice, so then you compute the T character and this should be the same as the T character of this. Uh, which actually there is the geometric Satake isomorphism, which um, Vladimir mentioned, geometric Satake isomorphism, and it gives uh, another formula for this in terms of the intersection Poincare polynomial of uh, certain um, closure of Schubert cycles in the affine Grassmannian. So it should be the product for all points where the support of this lies. And you take the intersection Poincaré polynomial of um, um, of the this Schubert cell uh, at CI and the closure of that. And in the case of the minuscule case, uh, it's actually always a smooth variety. It's some sort of Grassmannian, and that's why we saw those binomial coefficients. Right, and finally, and that's uh, also just to see that we can have a almost full, we would like to have a full understanding of this sheaf, right? So this is the sheaf we would like to understand uh, this Hecke transform teaching section. So we take the Hecke transform teaching section, um, then rest it. So this is going to have support at the upward flows uh, from Higgs bundles, which are above it in the partial order. And then if I restrict it to such a Higgs bundle, then the, it should be a, a vector bundle on that cell and that the fiber or the character of the fiber of this uh, should be adjust given by this uh, Lustig's uh, weight multiplicity, a T, T analog of weight multiplicity. So mu I, so you take this representation mu I and you take this is lambda is a, is a weight which, which is in the representation is precisely when it's uh, smaller or equal in the partial order. And then you take this uh, T uh, deformation. And so this one goes from I and this is uh, uh, a certain Kajdanustic polynomial. But again, everything should be computable only by doing the Hecke transformation of the Hitchin section on the G side and we get information about, so this is for, for the Leglance dual, and um, the multiplicities in the Leglance dual group. So that, that's, that's the end. Well, thanks a lot, Tamish. Um, so please, uh, questions or comments as usual, raise your electronic hand if you're remote or tell me if you are on site. So 
Okay, Demar, may I have a, a question? Uh, um, uh, if you can listen you, me. You want to ask something? Uh, yeah. Uh, uh, Demar, uh, well, one thing which I never really understood correctly. Well, there are, why, why Heckian transformation are called Heckian? Because, well, there is a relation to Heckian algebras, which well, I was speaking about. Yeah, there's something about flags in, um, uh, over finance field or whatever, and uh, counting points. And what is the relation between this, uh, these transformations, which are uh, some things very continuous? Right, I mean, right. So you first had the Hecke transformations for modular forms and stuff like that. This right. is now for the rational. So now you can reformulate instead of rationals, you can take the function field of a curve over a finite field then you get something, uh, then you get again um, things about uh, that, uh, that finite field. Um, and this is the complex version of that. So you replace um, when you do this algebra over finite, uh, the curve over a finite field, you can do this over uh, the curve over the complex numbers. I cannot hear you because you are, I cannot hear you. Uh, sorry, uh, if you want to uh, just obtain the ordinary finite dimensional Hecke algebra, so what what is the so you, you if you cannot interpret the ordinary he, finite dimensional Hecke algebra as a particular case of your I, I don't see the ordinary the, the finite Hecke algebra. The one we see here is the affine Hecke algebra, but I, I I learned all this three weeks ago, so. <laughs> <laughs> could could be there uh, somehow, but um... mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I see. Thank you. Uh, all right. So more questions or comments? Uh, remote or on site? Uh, Andres. Well, it's just a kind of far fetched, but. Uh... So, st so this is of course a, a very lucky thing here that we uh, normally we associated mirror symmetry with this uh, symplectic versus holomorphic world, and and here we somehow very luckily end up in some holomorphic holomorphic world. I mean, this is uh, uh, this is very fortunate. But so, is there also some some trace for the other uh, some other brains uh, that that. Uh, Oh, this is not the, yeah i can relate back to my original other checks yes yeah, so so there is more actually and that you will like very much because uh, we have an action of so do you have this symmetry which is given by the these hacky algebras but besides this you also have an action of sl to z on these categories and one of the operators is by the ample line bundle L, tensoring with the or line. That's the line bundle we studied. Mm -hmm. So, and this is here, tensoring with it. And uh, yes, and then the S, this is T, and then S is roughly related. And then S should somehow intertwine mirror symmetry again. And therefore, and then I don't exactly know what it, but there should be a relationship between this and the Hecke algebra symmetries and that's how I hope that eventually we can relate back to what we were studying. So it, it, it looks like that these line bundles whose cohomologies we studied with, so with Dandrash we studied something like this, the equivariant Euler characteristic of these line bundles. And these are operators in this SL2Z and they, they fit nicely into this. So it's, it's part of the bigger story. So if I want to do, uh, just say what I am, in this paper, we studied just what can you get from the structure sheaf with Hecke operators. So you can take the structure sheaf of your X moduli space. And we studied what kind of things you can get with Hecke operators. But then you can ask to also include these SL2Z operators. And I think that will be a larger class of objects, which will be very interesting. It will combine the ones I looked at here and the ones we uh, we're studying there. And I hope 
Oh, and then by the way, this formalism, this combinatorial formalism of the Kajdan boosting polynomials or called weight multiplicity is the same kind of combinatorics which showed up in that paper of Gupta we used, but I never understood that part. But the paper of Gupta in our combinatorial setup actually is about these uh, Kajdan boosting polynomials. So what I hope is that all uh, combinatorics there can be fused with this one when you extend your interest of brains which can be obtained from the structure sheet, not just by the hack operators, but also by the section of SR2Z. Okay, okay. Uh, thanks a lot. Uh, any more questions or comments, Dimitri? Yeah, just uh, maybe it's a bit naive, but you have this uh, minuscule weights and correspond to this one, 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 very stable bundles. And can you, there, there are other components and they also have, a, like if I don't, if I don't take one, 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 very stable bundle. Ah. Yes, so of course, this is somehow, as I say, uh, even not just metaphorically, is the tip of the iceberg. So we are up here with the type one, one things. We take the canonical Higgs bundle, we just follow the Hecat transformation. You always end up in type one, one, one. But besides this, for every partial, uh, every partially, uh, how do you know, the word? rank um, ordered partition of N, there is a type of fixed points. At the bottom, you have them and the type is N. That's the moduli space of stable bundles. It's where really the geometric evidence is happening. And then in between, you have all kinds of intermediate ones. Because of the work of um, Lomon, we know that there are very stable Higgs bundles in the bottom one, always. That's a, is a, one of his main results. But what happens in between is a, is a mystery. I mean, if I, in my the paper, we actually make more about this equivariant um, multiplicity. We prove it that for a very stable Higgs bundle, we can actually compute this equivariant multiplicity, which we can prove is always a polynomial, but it's an infinitesimal formula we have. So you can compute it for any type and any fixed point, and you will find fixed points where this quantity is not a polynomial. So we, will, we have a proof that certain components will not contain uh, very stable Higgs bundles. But sometimes for any three, for example, the situation is even more delicate because you have this obstruction that this equivariant multiplicity is a polynomial and that will uh, cancel a lot of, ex lot of fixed points of type 2-1, which cannot be uh, very stable, but it exactly what you can actually other ways you can prove that is not very stable. And therefore we conjecture that the remaining ones will be very stable, but we don't know how to prove them. For rank four, it's even less clear. We don't even have a conjecture of which uh, type, uh, we have several other types there. Three ones, uh, I don't know, two, two, one, two, one, 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 two, two, one, one, all kinds of other type of fixed points. And you can always compute or equivalent multiplicity. And sometimes it's not a polynomial, then you're good. But if, even if it's a polynomial, sometimes it's not very stable, cannot be very stable. So it's a big mystery in the middle. It's a lot of uh, extra problems uh, one can think about. Okay, th thanks a lot. Uh, any more questions or comments before the end of this workshop? Uh, well, uh, if not, Tamas and all the speakers, thanks again. Yes, and as usual, yeah. all participants, hopefully, we're going to see you. Uh, again, here in Le Diable Rail in other places, but I mean, why not in Le Diable Rail? And uh, uh, of course, it was great to have this hybrid combined event. Probably this form in some way will stay, but we would like to see more of you here on site. So, uh, 
All right. So uh, thanks again, and uh, maybe uh, bye bye. That was the final talk of this workshop. So we'll be closing this session now and uh, ending the workshop, unfortunately. But well, uh, and done before we close this session. Point. So thank you again for all of you, and uh, see you soon. Okay. Bye bye. Bye bye. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks for the organization.